So I'm here today to talk about the value of a college education and how we make that value in college education available to everyone. Now, the concept that ties those two things together is something called capital. And most of you know capital as money which is leverageable to buy other things, other assets. But there are other types of capital as well. For instance, education is a kind of capital. And we can use education to find wealth, we can use it to find power, and believe it or not, we can use it to find health as well. Now, everyone doesn't believe in the value of a college education. In fact, some people have questioned it, and those people often are college educated themselves or come from families who are college educated. And part of their main argument is that a college educated person rarely goes to work in the field they've trained for and often does not even go to work in a field that requires a college education. Now, I appreciate that. Let's take a parent who has sent a child to Kendall College of Art and Design to study illustration. Okay, so four years later, and a diploma in illustration, and that person goes to work as a bank cashier. You don't need a college education for that. In fact, you don't need a high school education for that. But if you had a college education, the likelihood is that you would be able to move up in, that you would, well, you'd make more money, 56% more than someone with a high school diploma, which is about $400,000 in the course of a lifetime. And moreover, if you had a college education as opposed to a high school one, you could move up in the bank and might even become a bank officer. It's also true that during the recession, someone with a college education was much more likely to be employed than someone with a high school education. And even today, the unemployment rate for someone with a high school diploma is 7.4%, 3%, around 3% with someone with a college diploma, and 11.1% if you haven't graduated from high school. And there are other benefits as well. Over the course of a lifetime, someone with a bachelor's degree, on average, will make almost a million dollars more than someone with a high school diploma. People with a college education are healthier, they live longer, and this is really important. Children of someone with a college education will score better on the SATs and are much more likely to go to college. So let's put it all together. College education, you get a job, it turns into a career. Both in the job you have and over the course of a lifetime, you make a lot more money. And then you're healthier and you live longer and your children are much more likely to go to college and enjoy all the same benefits that you enjoyed as a college graduate. That sounds pretty good to me. But I want to look again at this problem. The problem that many people who get a college education do not go to work in the field they trained in. Let's take, for example, Mike. Mike is a graduate of Kendall College of Art and Design in illustration. He never worked in illustration. Instead, he started a company that did graphic design, did interior design, and it wound up doing the information and technology design for Steelcase. His most recent client is Whirlpool Corporation, where he's designing the benefit programs. Not the packages, the cute little graphics for the benefit programs, but the programs themselves. Now, I think that we would imagine that all that illustration suits one for is to do pretty pictures, to paint pretty things. It's certainly the training you wouldn't choose if you wanted to design benefit programs for a major corporation. I talked to Mike about this, and he set me straight. He said that illustration was not about just doing pretty pictures. It was about a whole way of thinking, of problem solving that looked at a wide context and could come up with creative solutions. And this worked whether he was working for a client like Steelcase or a client like Whirlpool or any of his clients. Mike's not alone. Let's take Bob. Bob is the chairman of the Board Emeritus at Woodbury University, a college in Los Angeles that is 130 years old and specializes in design and business. He's also the vice chair of Pomona College, one of the top 10 colleges in the country. Bob studied English. He studied English literature, and he never worked in the field of English literature. 
In fact, he went to work in a bank. And in the bank, he did what many people who have English majors do. He became the head of marketing. <laughs> and he's a smart guy. He looked around and saw what people do in banks and said, you know what, I could do that. I could run one of these. I could make that. And because he was in marketing, he saw an unoccupied niche in the world of banking. And so he started a bank. And he was so successful that he was bought by Mellon, and he went on to the board of Mellon, and he wound up with eight-digit wealth. Now, I talked to Bob, and he told me that he had learned everything he needed to know about financial planning and how to analyze a, a balance sheet through studying English poetry, that in fact, analyzing poetry and analyzing a business required the exact same skill set. The thing about Bob is he did not come from a privileged background. His father was a shop steward in a steel factory in Pittsburgh. His father did not want him to go to high school. He wanted him to go into the factory, and I'm sure that Bob would have been incredibly successful there and very satisfied. But compared to eight-digit wealth and college-educated children who are incredibly successful, I think he might have made the right choice. Now, we all know that people like Bob and Mike are exceptional. I mean, they are bright. They are very, very, very bright. And of course, intelligence is useful in all situations, or in most situations, it's an adaptive advantage that is greater than physical strength and endurance. And this is true for other animals as well. So let's take the maize doll rat. The maize doll rat mates with another maize doll rat, and its offspring are maize doll. Now, what do I mean by maize doll? I mean, they're too stupid to pass the rest, rat SAT. They can't run through that maze and get the cheese at the other end. But if you do three things for the offspring of a maize doll rat when it's young, if you give it good food, <laughs> if you give it affection, and you give it the opportunity to play, <laughs> the maize doll rat turns maize bright. And the extraordinary thing about this is that if you take a maize doll rat that has been turned maize bright in that way and made it with another maize doll rat that has been turned maize bright that way, its offspring will also be maize bright. So, what do we make of this? The malleability of intelligence and the powerful effect of the surroundings on the formation of that intelligence and the ability for offspring to inherit the assets of a parent, those assets which sometimes are intangible, like intelligence, being bright. Well, the one thing that I know is that there are many parts of our population right now that have been disadvantaged because their parents did not go to school. Their parents did not have a high school education. And those children, the children of those parents, will probably not get a, a college education as well. Now, there are parts of our society that have been consigned to those peripheries, to the lowest socioeconomic status for a long time, and be, been deprived of the assets which would allow them to progress, typically African Americans and Hispanics, but others who have been deprived of education and the economic benefits of an education. Now, some may say that there's nothing wrong with this her hereditability of success. They may say that the poor will always be with us, and it is true. We need people at all levels of our society doing the jobs that are necessary. Others may say that having disadvantaged peoples at the margins of society for a long time poses ethical and moral dilemmas. Others argue that, they, that this situation poses a threat to the peace and security of our nation. And economists would say that it's also difficult to progress economically, and it's a challenge to our national economic security. I want to tell you about two instances where we were able, or I was able, or others were able to take the assets that students had and turn them into new education, because the only way out of this 
dilemma is either to get children who don't have those assets, those assets, or to find a way to leverage the assets they have now. So when I was in high school, our youth group decided that we would tutor fifth grade students. I was given uh, an African-American student who was struggling to read and struggling in social studies. He could not read his social studies text. He could not decipher the vocabulary or the sentence structure. He couldn't make sense of what was going on. My teach his teacher said to me that this child was incapable of learning. And I was doing something noble, but it wouldn't be successful. She actually was much more harsh and blunt when she said those words. So I decided that I would give him something that he could read, something that might lie in his experience. His reading list was comics. And for two months, he read comics, and after a while, he could read the words in a comic smoothly. He could understand what's going on in the story. At that point, I started him reading the social studies text again, and he could read that. He read it haltingly, of course, but he could read it. I was having dinner with my parents around the family table one night. There's a knock at the door. My father opens the door, and standing on the step outside is an elderly African-American woman holding a cake. She'd come across town in a bus to give me that cake for having saved her grandson. Let me tell you another story. This one's closer to home. This is in Holland, Michigan. Here, two teachers decided to teach a very difficult math lesson using human-centered design, project-based learning, and experiential learning, that is, leveraging the experiences of the students to create learning. This involved the whole fifth grade class, and there was one student who had always had a problem in math and hated the subject. But he confided to these two that finally he looked forward to coming to math and he loved the class. Don't tell my teacher, he said. Okay, so I've broken that. Um, anyway, all the kids took this class, and at the end they did projects and presented the results, and then they all took a standardized test. And here's the thing that I love. Not only did the fifth graders do better on that test than were expected, but on that standardized test, they outscored the eighth graders. How powerful to move a whole class using a pedagogy that turned their experience into an asset they could leverage to learn. Now, Pierre Bourdieu developed the idea that there are other types of capital than, than money. And we've just seen education that can be traded for things like money, but careers, power, health, the education of your children. The problem with capital is, as an asset, that it only trades in certain types of markets that recognize it. So, for instance, if you know Hamlet, that's going to help you in the boardroom. It may not help you get the job, but it will make a connection with other people and it will help you along your way. But you could be the greatest graffiti artist in the world, and it's not going to help you in the corporate world at all. In fact, that asset, that capital, only trades in your subcultural group. But what if? What if you could take the cultural capital of everyone and recognize that as an asset? What if you could use that asset to create a path for education that would make education available to all? Well, that's what we did in the case of the fifth grade student who learned reading through comics. It's what happened right here in Holland, Michigan. And it's what we're hoping will happen through a project that we're doing with Kendall College of Art and Design, Grand Rapids Public Schools, and the Grand Rapids Public Museum to create sixth through twelfth grade curricula in every subject based on human-centered design, project-based learning, and experiential learning. Because we're doing it in West Michigan and in Grand Rapids, it's a space for creativity and innovation, such an experiment is possible. But more important, because we're doing it here, we think it could work. This is where you can find out more if you're interested. Thank you for being here, and thank you for listening. <laughs>